Um, so, welcome everyone. Uh, yes, this is uh, one of our series of monthly evening talks. This is a special extra one because we actually had one a week ago. Uh, but uh, in honour of uh, Joe's book, we've put on a special uh, event to, uh, to, to talk about this. Um, we are promoting economic pluralism and basically what we're about is to try and raise awareness and provide space for different ways of thinking about the economy outside the sort of standard economics uh, that has sort of dominated in the past so that we can generate innovation and creativity to address the, the huge challenges uh, that have been growing and are facing over sustainability, uh, inclusiveness, uh, resilience and, and, and so on. And this evening, uh, I think we have, uh, for the first time, really tackle uh, a problem which is probably one of the, the big ones facing us, which is suddenly under question with uh, Trump and uh, people uh, and potential trade wars and, and so on, uh, globalization. And we're very honored to have Joe Zamet Lucia uh, come and talk about his book on this. Joe has had a very colorful uh, career. Um, having, I think, ticked more boxes than most people I know, having been uh, uh, in the health service, uh, uh, a doctor in the RAF, having been uh, uh, a conservation photographer uh, of uh, wildlife, uh, uh, having uh, exhibitions in New York, um, and also uh, be setting up a think tank, uh, Radix, uh, uh, to uh, the Radical Centre to develop new ideas. And I think we're in... Uh, advise, invest, you do just about everything. So in his spare time, he's found a moment to uh, write this book uh, about globalization. Uh, but uh, I'm sure it will be a, a fascinating and, uh, and uh, exhilarating uh, presentation. After that, we're privileged to have uh, Magda Polan, uh, who is an uh, economist at LNG Investment Management. Now, I don't know how much people know about LNG Investment Management, but I'm told that it's the biggest investor in Europe um, and uh, manager investment funds in Europe and has 5%, holds 5% of the shares of every single FTSE 100 company. Uh, so it's an incredibly uh, influential organization. Uh, and Manga's in charge of uh, understanding the emerging markets, as far as I understand, and obviously, which is a, uh, a key issue in the, um, globalization. So she will respond. Uh, and then we will open the floor uh, to discussion and, uh, and contro controversy and comments and, and whatever people uh, want to talk about. Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome Joe to start. Thank you. I think if I can pull this forward a little bit so I can reach it to change slides. Or you could, uh, uh, Steve, uh, Steve could change it. Okay, okay, that's, that's fine. That's, uh, that should work. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you, Henry, for the introduction. Yeah. And um, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Magda, for coming along and for all the help and advice you've given while we were writing this book, uh, which was uh, very, very helpful. Um, <coughs> so... Um, <coughs> particularly pleased to be here. Uh, one of our uh, aims at Radix is, uh, probably the only aim, <laughs> is to challenge conventional thinking. Um, so uh, that's what we try to do with everything that we produce. Um, <clears throat> we believe that the politics of right and left are kind of stale, um, and the center seems to be dying because of lack of ideas. Um, so we're hoping to try and generate some ideas which are neither right nor left and maybe a little bit um, controversial and certainly poking received wisdom. Um, <clears throat> we're here to talk about globalization and in particular about its future, whether it has a future. Now globalization is a big word. I mean, for starters, it's got 13 letters. The average, <laughs> the, the average word in the English language only has five. Um, <clears throat> but the concept of globalization encompasses a number of things. There's the cross-fertilization of cultures, uh, and the mutual understanding that we were all hoping for as such a vital part of globalization. And then there is trade, international trade. 
And it seemed to us that all these aspects of globalization are under threat today. There's a backlash. And what I'd like to do in this talk is to examine why. Why are we fed up with this? Why is the phenomenon of globalization that until recently was seen as an unalloyed good um, and seemingly unstoppable now seems to be at risk of being shunted into reverse gear? And is there anything we can do about it? Or maybe even is there anything we should do about it? Um, <clears throat> and I'll spend most of the time talking about the why rather than the remedies um, for several reasons. Because before reaching for our prescription pad, we should all make sure we have a reasonably correct diagnosis because otherwise we do more harm than good. And in my view, we have not really spent enough time talking about what is going on. Why is there this backlash against globalization? Um, secondly, finding the right prescription, of course, is not at all easy. Um, and I'll have a couple of slides at the end with some suggested ideas. But I think if we can get some common understanding of the issues, then solutions over time will emerge. Um, so I won't go into too much detail about the solutions because I don't think we have the, we can pretend to have the answer. And frankly, neither does anybody else. But if there are responses <coughs> to be found, they need to be built on a clear understanding, at least a shared understanding of what's going on. Uh, the other reason I won't go into so much detail about the solutions is that I don't want you to feel at the end of this talk, that you don't need to buy the book. So, <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> so the first question is, what is going on? And I'd like to start by telling a tale of angels and demons, or heroes and villains. And tales of angels and demons have enchanted us all in fiction, mm -hmm. in Hollywood movies, <clears throat> over the centuries, um, over, the, over the years. And they're very seductive tales particularly since we all tend to fall for them when they put us on the side of the angels. But these tales are best left where they belong, in the world of fiction and escapism. And it's dangerous to get into the mindset of angels and demons um, in the messy world of real politics. So let's start by going back to November last year at the G20 meeting in Hamburg, where Chancellor Merkel and President Xi put themselves center stage at that meeting. They presented themselves as the defenders of free trade and the prosperity it has brought to billions of people. And that is the, the key element of the narrative that is now in circulation. Um, <clears throat> around the whole question of globalization and free trade. It's the narrative that we are being fed, that Germany and China are the angels of the peace. They are the defenders of trade as we know it, and we all want free trade, right? And then we now have a new demon of the peace, uh, President Trump, the person who's throwing up in the air, the post-war world order, and shocking everybody. Um, <clears throat> and this narrative is attractive. Uh, it fulfills what psychologists call cognitive ease. In other words, it appeals to all our preconceived ideas. We are faced with a Germany and China that have been very successful, and let's face it, we all envy them a little bit. Um, and in the other corner, we have a U.S. president who, if I may put it this way, doesn't go out of his way to be liked. So the angels and demons narrative, you know, we can easily buy into without really doing a lot of thinking. Um, it appeals to what Daniel Kahneman calls system one thinking. Quick, intuitive thinking, doesn't require a lot of work, um, and just fits in with what we expect to be the narrative. Um, we don't have to do the system two analytical thinking, that's really too much hard work. 
The trouble is that much of what our System 1 thinking accepts actually turns out to be wrong. So just to put forward one chart, Germany and China have been the two countries that over the last decade have implemented the largest number of restrictive trade practices <coughs> of any country. As Benjamin Franklin put it, one of the greatest tragedies in life is the murder of a beautiful theory by a gang of brutal facts. <laughs> so my aim today is to get us out of simply accepting the narrative that we're being fed, to help us do a little bit more of the hard thinking about what is actually going on and maybe create a new narrative. And I promise that this slide is not the ultimate aim of my talk today. <laughs> because there are no angels, there are no demons, there are just leaders of countries doing what they think is best. And in reality, none of us really know what that is. Learned papers can be published with all sorts of seemingly elegant solutions. But when they hit the inelegant and very challenging world of real politics, the real trade-offs that affect people's lives, <clears throat> then none of it seems to be imbued with this elegant simplicity. The one thing that's for sure is that the world is changing rapidly before our very eyes. It's changed out of all recognition from the post-war period when all our current globalization structures were put in place. And it continues to change at a very rapid pace more rapidly that, than our institutions can change. Because it's the nature of institutions that they only change very slowly. And I'd like to divide those changes into three categories, political, cultural, and economic. <coughs> and I'll address each in turn. And I'd particularly like to start with the political. Why? Because although trade is often discussed in economic terms, Trade is fundamentally about politics. We cannot understand trade unless we first take a political perspective. Trade is not an end in itself. <coughs> it's an instrument of domestic and foreign policy. So it may be true that trade increases welfare, um, whatever that is, uh, and as such, it may be one tool of many that governments might deploy to increase welfare. They'll have to trade that off against other ways in which welfare might be increased. They need to look at how that welfare is spread, who gains, who loses. What are the social, cultural and political implications of all of that? Similarly, trade can be used as a way to project power um, or as a way that you know, to get rich through projecting power, which the British Empire was very good at doing. Uh, again, one of many ways in which that can be done. All this to say that the standard late 20th century narrative that international trade increases welfare, and that's it. No further discussion. There's no need to say anything else. Um, that's much too simplistic a way of looking at it. And we'll come to that again a bit later. So talking about politics, how has the world geopolitical structure changed and what are the implications for globalization? <clears throat> so the post-war world was characterized by what's called the Washington Consensus. We had a globalization overseen by these wonderful Bretton Woods institutions, the concept of global governance, the whole thing was steered by the hegemonic power of the United States. So apart from the USSR that chose to shut itself off from the world, we only had one single power in the world, the US. It steered everything, and everyone largely followed, and benefited. And Western, Western <coughs> liberal democracy was believed to be the aspiration for everybody. The whole world was going to become a liberal democracy because that was best. Well, no longer. The first major change is that the idea of global governance is really no longer widely accepted. We're seeing a resurgence of the nation state as the locus of democratic legitimacy. 
the Bretton Woods institutions and their, their <coughs> democratic legitimacy is being questioned. Their power is waning. They're seen by the developing world as being still too dominated by the West in terms of their governance structures. And by the West, even though they dominate them, as no longer able to defend their interests. In terms of trade, we no longer see a world steered by the United States, but rather evolving into three major trading blocks, the US, the EU, and China, each with their sphere of influence. <clears throat> China's success, a revanchist Russia, the rise of political strongmen in countries like Turkey, the rejection of democracy, explicit rejection of democracy as a goal by countries in the Middle East, the invention of illiberal democracy, within the European Union itself. All these things have put to bed, at least for the moment, the idea of the globalization of a single political structure, that of liberal democracy. As regards trade, <coughs> the 20th century narrative was that of the spread of prosperity through free trade, which led to the rise of the multinational corporation, an economically efficient structure that was supposed to optimize performance through cherry-picking the best of what each country or region had to offer. In terms of economic efficiency, it was a tremendously positive development. But now we have the political backlash. What was seen as a model of economic efficiency is now seen as an instrument of arbitrage in jobs, taxes and investment. In other words, multinational companies are seen as playing off one country against the other, driving a race to the bottom, and developing more political power than legitimately elected governments. In other words, some argue that we're moving from democracy to a plutocracy, or maybe that we're already there. Finally, security. Once again, the US used to be the underwriter, essentially, of global security. We lived in a prosperous and largely peaceful world where we could just trade with each other. Our security was guaranteed by the dollars of the American taxpayer. No longer are trade and security separate. The US worries about electronics made in China that could have inbuilt back, door, back doors and the threat to security. As we move to a largely digital economy, everybody's concerned about the security threats posed by hacking, even in areas that were previously thought as having really nothing to do with security. As the CEO of Baidu put it, the days where a car is made in one place and sold everywhere are over, because a car that can drive itself is by definition a weapon. Who would have thought only a few years ago that trade in automobiles could become a national security issue? And of course, China has its own views about the relationship between data, information flow, and national security. So with all these developments, it's been known, well published since the 1980s, that such a structure is much more likely to re lead to competition between blocks rather than cooperation. The sort of multilateral, co the multilateral collaboration that characterized the second half of the 20th century is highly unlikely in this new geopolitical structure. And that's exactly what we're seeing. International trade has always, a bit like nature, it's always been a delicate dance between competition and cooperation. And the tune of that dance has changed. So the cause of the competition we are seeing evolving before our eyes is geopolitical structure, not simply a US president that is out of control. And it was all predictable and predicted. Then there are the cultural changes. <clears throat> and these are vitally important to trade. Why? Well, there was a time when tariffs were the main barrier to trade. No longer. Now the main barriers are regulatory ones. And regulations reflect local cultural norms. So trade as well as other aspects of globalization, like the free movement of people, invariably impinge on local sensitivities and local cultural norms. We hear about chlorinated chickens and GMOs and things. These are all 
local cultural norms. For decades, multiculturalism was the order of the day. Free movement of people was a good thing. It mingled skills and cultures, brought benefits and mutual understanding. In other words, the late 20th century narrative was one of cultural and religious coexistence. Multiculturalism was going to be underpinned by the opening up of global communications, social media platforms, and all these things that would build, that would be a force for good and build greater mutual understanding. I don't need to tell you that all of this has changed. Now the focus is on social cohesion as vital to the solidarity without which democracies cannot function. We live in a world of identity politics, whether that identity is underpinned by religion, nation, or simply political positions, like whether you're pro or anti-Brexit, becomes an identity issue. We are, one way or another, living in a time of culture wars rather than multiculturalism. Now we worry about the threats from global communications. Social media platforms can be the agents we've discovered can be the agents of hate and division, just as much as they can be catalysts of mutual understanding. We worry about privacy, the abuse of personal data, fake news, interference in elections, and the national security implications of an uncontrollable world of personal data. <coughs> then comes consumption. Globalization <coughs> was built on the idea of defining human beings as one thing and one thing only consumers. Weekend before last, I was stuck in an airport for much longer than I would have liked. And I wandered around and took these pictures. This is what globalization has brought to us, if we choose to define ourselves as consumers. We can now consume as much of this sort of tat and garbage as we like, because it's made somewhere cheap. Uh, we can buy tons of it, we can throw it away and buy the next lot. This, I guess, is one part of the, def economic, of the economist's definition of welfare. But again, this is changing. The idea that welfare is largely defined by consumption is maybe not quite evaporating, but it's certainly a bit weaker than needs. Many people are feeling there's a little bit more to life than consumption. And we're also starting to wonder whether it is true that anything goes for a penny off. We're starting to be concerned about the labor conditions that underpin our thousand dollar iPhones. Yes, we have ILO guidelines running to several hundred pages. Uh, companies say they have their own guidelines about supply chains. But we all know that very little of it is actually either implemented or enforced. And we're starting to be concerned about the environmental damage wrought by a combination, by the combination of a world of consumption, a finite planet, and the never-ending search for that penny off. These images are from Madagascar, which is one of the, which has been <coughs> largely destroyed um, by <coughs> extraction. And we're also starting to wonder whether it really makes sense that comp for components to have to travel three times around the globe <coughs> to be finally assembled and then shipped yet again to their final destination. I think you wrote, Nick, that emissions from world shipping was forecast to grow by something like 250% over the next, I don't know how long, five, ten years. And we have no solution for that. In a world ruled by the triumvirate of consumption-driven economics, international trade, and the endless search for a penny off. Economists call them externalities. Seems such a harmless and elegant word. But culturally, we seem less and less willing to put up with them. Finally, let's get to the economics of international trade. I like this statement from Professor Roderick Harvard. Comparative advantage and the gains from trade. Let's examine them both in turn. 
And on the left, we have a picture of David Ricardo, whose theory of comparative advantage underpins the whole concept of international trade. It's a powerful theory. It was published in 1817. I'm not proposing that we throw it out, but would it not be reasonable at least to have some public discussion as to how much of it still applies two centuries later? We live today in a world that would be totally unrecognizable to Ricardo. In his time, comparative advantage lasted a very long time. Maybe not today. Technological advance happens very quickly. Technology transfers ha transfer happens in a flash. New skills and capabilities are built. Old skills are enhanced through education and technology. In such a fast-moving world, is it reasonable to deindustrialize, to give up skills and capabilities built up over decades or centuries, because someone is deemed to have a comparative advantage that might last only five minutes. And Ricardo's theory was predicated on the constraint of goods of equivalent quality. But what does that mean today? Today we can hire a marketing agency to magic up a new definition of quality in five minutes. It's doubtful whether goods or services of equivalent quality actually exist any longer. Everything is differentiated even if only at the margins. And it's enveloped in a halo of marketing and advertising activity that forms part of our conception of quality. And the variety is endless. And of course, Ricardo lived in a world that largely traded in goods. Today, we live in a world that trades significantly in services. As I said, I'm not trying to throw this out, but it's rather amazing to me how little discussion there is about what comparative advantage means in a fast-moving 21st century world. How a two centuries old theory is still somehow treated like some kind of religious dogma, never to be challenged. So what about the second element, the gains from trade? Yes, there are, there are gains, but there are also downsides. Institutions of globalization have now come up with this statement. Something that has been, I don't know when they published this, but maybe a couple of years back. They've now come up with this statement, which is something that has been obvious to every factory worker that has lost his or her job over the last 50 years. We risk getting dragged into a world where as long as our economic models throw out a number at the end that's a net positive, the social disruptions that are embedded in the workings of such models get ignored, or at the very least, insufficiently valued. The reality is that the gains from trade have been highly asymmetrical. When I speak to people in the trade world about this, I always get the same response. Job losses have not come from trade, they've come mainly from technological advances. Well, I believe that's plain wrong. Yes, some have come from technological advancement, but they've also come from the asymmetric gains and losses of the current international trade system. So it's not either or, it's also and. We can't keep persisting with a trade structure that gives us so much asymmetry. So in domestic policy terms, it's worth asking the question, are the gains from trade worth the social, political and economic downsides? One analysis of the impact of NAFTA concluded that the net gain in U.S. welfare was less than a tenth of one percent. Yet vulnerable groups saw a fall in their wage growth by around 17 percentage points. If you were running a country and had responsibility for the welfare of your citizens, the people who voted you in and whose taxes you collect, would you take this deal? Or would you look for some other ways to gain less than a tenth of one percent? Or maybe not bother at all for such a small amount. Let's talk about mercantilism. The idea that trade was all about exports. That the more you exported, the wealthier you got, the more gold in your national coffers. In the mercantilist's mind, trade is only about exports. In the 20th century, <clears throat> Mercantilism was considered a dirty word. 
who were all supposed to import ex and export and not worry too much about trade balances. In reality, the mercantilist mentality never really went away. Do you think Germany and China would be spent standing up so aggressively for the current <coughs> trading system if, they, if instead of huge trade surpluses, they had huge trade deficits? <coughs> it's interesting. Some work done in emerging markets asked people if they believed that international trade was a good thing. The overwhelming response was positive. We love it. They then asked whether they believed that their countries should be importing stuff. And they said, no, we don't want to do that. Um, we shouldn't be importing stuff. So there again, trade in people's minds is associated with selling things to others. The mercantilist mentality is alive and well everywhere you look. And we now understand that large unidirectional trade imbalances are not sustainable forever. They have to be funded either by foreign debt or by selling assets to foreign investors. They imply a huge loss of sovereignty. Finally, let's talk about money. Many trade deals contain within them the liberalization of capital accounts. But the free flow of capital is not at least what I understand by trade. We need to separate flow of capital from trade in financial services. They're two different things. They're often lumped in the same box, but they're fundamentally different issues. <coughs> the free flow of capital was intended to be the underpinning of investment and growth, and to an extent it has been. But today we recognize that the daily flow of many trillions of dollars around the globe brings not only benefits but also issues. First of all, we're struggling with the illicit flow of money in money laundering activities. So the greater the flow of capital across the borders, the easier it is to slip this in. We're also struggling with how to deal with tax arbitrage. I mentioned before that one of the challenges of trade is the asymmetrical benefits that some people benefit and others lose dramatically. And those who defend the status quo claim that there is the responsibility of individual governments to make up for that through the welfare system. The problem is that in a world that's awash with tax arbitrage, government coffers are increasingly under strain. They are ever more unable to use the welfare system as a cushion. So we can't have it both ways. But maybe most important, don't know, is the destabilization, this destabilizing effect of the flow of so-called hot money. Money that flows in large amounts into economies and then, as they hit a bump in the road, flow out just as rapidly, causing destabilization. The IMF has now accepted that liberalization of the capital account may not always be appropriate. Something to be treated with caution and the issues are maybe amplified in the low interest rate world. So what does this all mean? Are we, if I had put this slide up a few years ago, some would have thought of it as some kind of hippie poster. <clears throat> Today, it comes out of the mouths of the Davos crowd, the champions of global trade and distributed supply chains. I wouldn't be surprised if localism became the subject of a Davos meeting a few years down the road. And there are many forces putting, pushing in this direction. More and more companies are looking towards closed-loop supply chains, what's called the circular economy. Such thing is not viable, but it's actually pretty pointless if, uh, if supply chains remain distributed around the world. Mass-produced goods are no longer the only future. Of course, they'll remain an important part of our economies, but increasingly people are looking for tailored goods and services, even co-production. None of it is viable if it's scattered around the globe. And of course, we're still struggling to work out what a digital economy will and should look like. When once it was seen as a facilitator of globalization, um, we now understand the issues with network effects and monopoly power, data privacy and security that I mentioned, that's all leading to the balkanization of data. 
So where does this all get us? The challenge is to overcome our current tendency to polarization, where the so-called defenders of free trade fold their arms and insist that everything must stay the same, while others think that the whole thing is unfair, a total mess, and we should just tear it down. The view that we express in the book is this one. Current free trade structure is a 20th century creation based on 19th century economics. It's no longer fit for a 21st century world. We shouldn't throw it out, but we must reform it, and we must find ways to reimagine it. The trouble, of course, is that institutions avoid change like the plague. They're always comfortable with the status quo, some argue that deep and severe crises are necessary to produce real change. So where's that crisis going to come to drive change? Maybe it's going to come from here. <laughs> Is President Trump the disruptive force we need to force change? Is it possible that it'll take a credible threat from the US to bring the whole system down? Uh, before sluggish institutions uh, start to rethink and move into the 21st century. As we know from the actions that we've seen, President Trump and his team don't have the answer <laughs> to what is a very complex issue. But he has forced a different conversation. Nobody has the answer, but we'll never find the answer unless we have the conversation. But what could a new settlement look like? Well, who knows? We put down some ideas in the book. The first is that stability only comes from change. Um, if you keep things rigid, stuck in aspect, they will collapse because the world is changing around you. So if we want stability, we have to change. The other point I'd like to make is trade policy can't stand alone. It's part of, as I said, domestic and uh, foreign policy objectives. So it must be developed within that context. The way that globalization has developed has given, has created a lot of oligopoly power, and competition authorities just seem to be sitting on their hands. I noticed that. In the last few days, the EU has decided that it's not going to interfere with any intra-EU mergers because they want to create European world champions, so yet more oligopolistic power. Now, I think we need to return to the basic principle that trade, as envisaged by Copton, is intended to create competition. It's not intended to embed those who are already there. And we seem to have lost that idea. I believe that we need to accept that persistent unidirectional trade imbalances are ultimately politically, socially and economically corrosive. Of course, as you speak to the Germans, they don't accept this. Their view is if people want to buy our Mercedes because they're great products and, we can, and we're very productive in how we produce them, then they should buy them. Um, but in the long run, they're very corrosive. Promote localism, and I think we all see the... It doesn't mean that, I'm not suggesting here, that um, Bristol, Manchester and Liverpool should all make their own jumbo jets. Um, that's clearly not, not the objective. But, but you know, we've seen a lot of local businesses disappear, which don't have to. We need to focus on regulatory convergence rather than tariffs, and this is a challenge because regulatory convergence is very difficult to do. Um, which is why we believe that what you need is broad framework trade agreements, not try to get all singing or dancing free trade agreements that try to cover everything, but create a framework and an intent to converge and do more over time as, as things evolve.
We need a trade policy that can promote SMEs, not just large multinationals. And one of the problems with complex systems, as we've seen in the UK with um, uh, public procurement, is that the people who win the contracts, the people who thrive, are not necessarily the people who can do the best job. They're the people that, who can negotiate the bureaucracy best. Mm. Their skills are actually in negotiating the system. Um, and the more complex the system becomes, the more people who learn how to negotiate that system win. Um, so we can do more, I think, to promote SMEs in international trade. They don't have the resources. I believe we should prioritise trade over investment. There's been a lot of talk, you know, as we know, inward investment and all these sort of things, but what we want to prioritise, what we want to do is trade with people. We want to be able to buy and sell things uh, to other people. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, as I mentioned earlier, capital movement is not trade in financial services. Um, we need to, to think more about, you know, these large international money flows. Now, how, we, how one could possibly put that genie back in the bottle is not clear. And the investor state dispute settlement systems that have raised so many hackles around the world where investors are protected um, is, I think, on its last legs. It seems to me that investment carries risk. And investors know that. And they should take that risk. There is no reason why they should be protected from that risk. We should promote cultural links. And maybe these are more important than trade in promoting mutual understanding in a world of culture wars. And we need to be a little bit more transparent about the costs and benefits to different parts of the population of trade. I think there's a political imperative that we're more honest with people rather than the summary, the single line summary of trade as a net, a net positive. I'll close by leaving you with this um, quote from Keynes in his speech to the Irish government in 1933, his speech about self-sufficiency. And this is not a very well-known speech, uh, it wasn't, has, wasn't popular in the late 20th century in a world of globalization uh, and was sort of dismissed as being a protectionist speech. But of course it never was. And Keynes was one of the most liberal economists ever. But I think there are um, many wise words in, in, in this. You know, Let goods be homespun whenever it's reasonably and conveniently possible. Um, and let finance be primarily national. Um, globalization has broken with both of those. And in the context of Brexit, I think the next sentence is important. Um, those who seek to disembarrass a country of its entanglements should be slow and wary, which is not a matter of tearing up roots, but slowly letting the plant grow in a different direction. Um, I think that's something that we might want to think about through the Brexit process, but also about the globalization process. It's not a matter of throwing it out the window and uh, tearing up its roots, but we should maybe start to think about how to train the plant to grow in a somewhat different, more positive direction. Thank you.